Hey guys, welcome back. It is your favorite GIMP with a limp and I'm here with a special treat for you. I am taking a look at two minutes to midnight. This is coming to Kickstarter soon. It is by Plague Island, uh, Island Games and it is designed by Stuart Tong. Hope I'm saying that right. Tong or Tonga, one way or the other. Sorry, Stuart. Don't hold it against me. Uh, anyway, he contacted me and asked if I would be nice enough to take and give the game a one over. And I said, absolutely, I will. So he has sent me a prototype copy of the game so I can show it to you guys and kind of give you a heads up of how it's going to work. So with that said, keep in mind, as I've said before with all of them, it's a prototype. What you're seeing is not final components. Uh, but I will say this. From what I have seen, I'm expecting good components because for a prototype copy to have as good of quality as this one does inspires confidence. A nice mounted board here uh, for the map, actually both the maps, but we'll get onto that here in just a few minutes. Nice wooden cubes and plastic discs and all the pieces are good. The cards even are nice and thick so you guys can hear that. Uh, cards are good quality like straight out of the box for a prototype copy it i mean it's it's borderline uh production copy the only thing is the uh the pieces are laser cut so if you guys can see it's got the little burnt edges that uh i like i gotta say i like that little burnt wood smell that comes with it because it's uh kind of a hint of hey this is something early you're getting a, a sneak peek if you will now obviously from looking at this and the cover to the game right there, that's the box of it. Uh, you're going to automatically be thinking of a few different games. We'll say it right off the bat. Uh, Twilight Struggle. Obviously, this looks like it. And this is one of the games uh, in that similar vein. So if you have played Twilight Struggle, you're going to have an idea of what's going on here. But this is, this is ratcheted up a bit. Okay, Twilight Struggle... Uh, Twilight Struggle is definitely a lower complexity game than Two Minutes to Midnight. This one has uh, a lot more depth, I would say, going on. There's uh, a lot more moving pieces that you have to keep track of versus uh, Twilight Struggle, but you guys will be seeing that here in a minute. So what I'm going to do for the overview to kind of make this simple and give you guys an idea of how the game is going to play is we're just going to do a quick overview, go around the map, um, my Southern's coming through the map, show you guys all the pieces, what's going on with our little display board over here, kind of explain the basics, right? And then we're going to take and run through some of these cards because there is a good example of play in the back of the rule book that goes over it and it shows you you know how everything's going to work and it's coming from the designer himself i really like that so we're going to walk through it we're going to play the game where it's kind of set out but that way you guys can see it like in its flow how everything's going to move uh with the cards actually in play all right i'm going to start at the top left and kind of move around on the board and as we're looking at it now this is your united states uh side okay this is like their player board. If you're playing as the US, this is where you're going to keep track of your stuff. So name across the top, uh, the national debt plus one per turn. What it means is you're kind of moving that back. So money is the way you take turns in this game. And we'll see that when we start rolling through our cards. But if you ever get all the way over over to here, then you're getting like uh, victory. So uh, it's reducing the national debt. OK, when it comes to uh, the U.S., that's how they get money in this game is that they can move this piece across into higher levels of debt. But then they get those debt cards that they can put into the deck that's going to be shuffled through. So in essence, they kind of get extra turns. They can buy extra turns, but they're kind of indebting themselves with it. So there are negatives that come with it as you push that debt higher and higher and higher. Now, also, the U.S. has an election. It's a constitutional republic, so unlike the Soviet Union over there, uh, their leaders are not dictators. So we have a 2d6 roll that's going to happen over here. There are modifiers, and this is going to happen each turn. And then there are some bonuses that you can get, and you'll place these little discs on there to show that you have that bonus. Like, 
Here, five, we have a reroll for one trade roll or a containment reroll one influence roll in a non communist government. So, we'll show you that uh, what a non communist government looks like here in a little bit. Victory progress down here for our little uh, starter scenario that we're doing, it starts on four. And you're like, okay, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Four, it's just two spaces away from the win. Well, that's not exactly how this one's going to work. As you move this up, Yes, you get a victory point, but it doesn't stay here. So if you move this track all the way up and you gain victory points, you will take one of these counters and this is your actual victory point. So you hit your six and it drops all the way back and you'll have this counter and you're playing to whatever, depending on your scenario, how long of a game that you're playing. But you either want to have three more of these than your opponent to win or either the most of them if you reach the end of the game. But that does work backwards as well, though, because if your victory track is like this and you have to go down on it for whatever reason, you have to give up one of these tokens that you have previously acquired and then set your token track back wherever it's going to be, depending on how many points you had lost due to whatever action the game told you. The Soviet uh, victory point track is going to work. Their victory progress is going to be the same way. It is a little different. I'll show you on their board here in a sec. And then over here, fairly simple, is the force pool. Now, this is what it says to start off with. When it comes to this, don't think of this as everything that's going to go like on the map. Stuff that actually goes on the map is only spies and your armies. The rest of this stuff, there's a bunch of others that uh, I'll show you guys when we take a look at that research board. Uh, things like bombers, subs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. It's all about the mad mutually assured destruction, the nuclear cold war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So these items go towards that. You're not going to like place a, a bomber on the map somewhere. They'll be placed into the strategic holding box and they're going to kind of count towards that nuclear power that you have. So the more of these you have, the higher your ability is to kind of wage nuclear war, which will give you bonuses, but could cause unrest, things like that. Uh, I'll show you guys that here in just a second, but you got to pay for these things. Everything that you're doing pretty much costs money. So your turns come from your money and you have to decide what you're going to spend that money on. Are you going to spend it on spies? Are you going to spend it on armies? Are you going to spend it on your nukes? Are you going to spend it influencing other countries? Now, very quickly, just to show you the Soviet Union one, it is different from the U.S. because they have other things going on. And as a bonus, something that they included that I think is nice because it shows their thinking of the players is they included a player aid of this board because these are printed onto the board. But it's a player aid of this in case you're playing across the table from your opponent. That way you can flip this upside down and it'll be on the right side if someone's sitting on that side of the table. So like the US player would be sitting here and Soviet player would be sitting here and it would orient this in the correct uh, direction for that player. I really like when they take steps like that. Now you see Soviets have their little force pool too. Here's their victory progress track. For our little scenario, it's gonna start on three. And there's a lot more going on over here than we saw just on the, uh, the U.S. side. They have things like oil production and oil price and their five-year plan here. When it comes to oil, kind of think of that like similar. It's definitely not the same, but similar to the, the U.S. debt track. It's a way that they can get extra money cards into the deck that they can use to take extra turns with. Five-year plan has to do with a potential bonus that the Soviets can get if they succeed in doing whatever it is that's supposed to be for their five-year plan. Like it starts on farming. So if they do succeed in their farming goal, then they get certain bonuses. Tech theft placement. This has to do with the theft of technology, which is big because the U.S. gets a lot more bonuses towards technologies and starts off with a lot more technologies already researched, which we will be showing you on the other board. Like I said, the Soviets need to steal some of those technologies. That's how they're going to get ahead is by kind of playing catch up with the US and taking from what they've already accomplished. 
our little Western trade thing here had uh, has a fair amount going on with it. The basic gist being that Stalin didn't want to get too involved with the West and what all they had going on. So this has to do with things like the U.S. putting embargoes on them and them trying to get certain materials later on. Uh, up here, when we get into the Soviet leadership and the reforms, it obviously starts off with Stalin alive, but he does die at some point in the game. And then as the game's going to go on, you're going to get different types of leaders for for the Soviet Union, depending on certain roles, certain modifiers, and then freedom and reforms are going to happen. And you see, like, for example, here, progressive allowed. You don't get to get this level of a leader. That's why it has a little counter with a no on it until your freedoms and reforms has been pushed up to at least this level. There's a, a lot more going on when it comes to the leadership over here for the Soviet Union, uh, kind of a little balancing act, but they do get potentially a lot of victory points if they push this freedom and reforms. At first it starts off kind of good for them, but then it can start generating a lot of unrest for the Soviet Union as they push up this track. But like I said, they're kind of flirting with those victory points as well. So that pushing up this track can cause them pain, but can give them victory points to potentially win the game for them. Sorry, I had to rearrange things, tip one of my lights down because I was getting a little shadow from my uh, tripod here. Uh, anyway, right here is just a quick example of our map, right? So it's the world map, but we're just taking a look at Europe as our example. And you'll notice, uh, again, similarities to Twilight Struggle, your influence uh, cubes going around, things like that, the countries being in certain colors. Now with this, the countries that are blue are allied more into democracy. They're more towards the U.S. Countries that are red are more towards the Soviets. They're communist countries. The countries that are gray are authoritarian countries, so they're not flipped one way or the other yet. As an example, you can see Yugoslavia here, however, actually starts off and they're now kind of officially communist. They've got a red disc in there to signify that they are now a communist country. If they had a blue one, they would be a democratic country. Now you can have up to three of your color cubes into a country. The cubes, the third one doesn't necessarily matter. It's kind of like a buffer against extra uh, interference from your opponent. But if you have one, that country is aligned to you. If you have two, they're fully aligned to you. So they're way onto your side. And then three, they're just double fully aligned. You know, it's no extra bonus at that point, except as a buffer, like I was saying. So you want to get these cubes into these countries and that's called your influence. But it's not that easy because there is a role. You don't just pay money and automatically place the influence you need to make a roll and it's not that easy of a roll unless you have extra modifiers that are going in your favor. One of those modifiers you can get is from doing things like investing into the country. And that's going to be one of the actions that you can take on your turn. Just like you can buy things from your force pool, you can choose to invest in countries. And the amount that it's going to cost or how many rather you can invest in kind of depends on the the level, the value of that country. We see here, France, they've got factory symbols and they have two in them. So they are a more industrial country. They are stronger, a stronger economy. And as such, it takes a larger investment. But smaller countries who don't have a two in there, they're easier to invest in. So you can invest in more of those with a single action than you can uh, one of these larger countries. Now, all these other markers that are going on, we're going to get into as we're playing the game. Things like the Civil War or being occupied or having one of your armies located there. We see the Soviets start off with an army in Ukraine. All of these things matter when it comes to gaining your influence onto a country. All right, Just understand that it's affecting things, whether or not it's occupied, whether or not you have investments, whether or not you have an army there. All of these things, whether or not you have allied countries around them, can affect how easy it is to get your influence cubes into a country. Obviously, it's going to be harder, for example, like the Soviets, 
they're going to have a harder time influencing Canada over here than they would have influencing these red countries that are right here adjacent to them. While we're here, I'll just point out here are some of the cards and I've already got them set up for play. So I'm not going to take and start showing them to you yet. We'll show them when we start uh, playing the, the actual game itself. Uh, it is good quality though, just like I was mentioning before, but you're going to be operating off a single deck. Okay, so you're just going to flip the top card and do whatever it is. If it's a US money card, then the US gets their actions. They get to choose what they're going to be doing. Soviet money, same thing. And then if it's not one of those, then the card will kind of lay out what you're supposed to do. And we'll see that here in a second. Uh, down here in the corner, they do have a nice little key uh, just to remind you of what everything is. Democracy, authoritarian, communist. Uh, coup level, how much um, how much unrest needs to be in the country before a coup will be started, uh, worth of the country, again, that's what those factories are representing, oil can play a factor in that, uh, certain waterways with the aircraft symbol, aircraft carrier symbol rather, do grant certain bonuses to the USSR if they can control them. A blue line means a country is sea adjacent, a white line means land adjacent, and then if they have these symbols, they are a geographical objective for that side and can grant extra bonus points. So if we're looking here again, just as an example, you see these white lines connecting these countries that shows land adjacent. Blue lines show they are sea adjacent. And then over here, Panama Canal, you see the little aircraft carrier. So the Soviets do want to try to gain control of this area. That's a good bonus for them. All right, so this board is the other board that comes with the game, and there is a lot going on over here. There's a lot you need to keep track of. Towards our left side is our turn track. Any extra money that the turns uh, the sides get is shown on here. You see they start at the beginning with five and then so on as it changes all the way up to turn nine where we get into 1990. Uh, any other markers like things like no leader role for this term for the Soviets will be marked there. It's uh, really self-explanatory. I do like how they have this laid out nice and neat. Uh, in the center here is our technology research. And this is where it starts off with the basic game, a little introductory game. And these blue discs mean that the Americans have already researched this. So they already know these technologies. The Soviets have these technologies. And you see the Americans are actually ahead of them in nukes, obviously, because this is right after World War II. They've already got a bomber, so the ability to get bombers isn't located there for them anymore. They've already dropped bombers. But you see ICBM would be the next level up, and both of those counters are still there. So no one has the ability to get those just yet. Then it goes up to the sub launches, MIRVs, mobile missiles, all the way to stealth bombers. So basically what you want to think of when it comes to this research track is it's a bunch of different bonuses for the, the short way to think of it. It's a lot deeper than that, but there are certain bonuses you can get by researching your level up this track. So you want to take and get in there. Things like co-breaking is a special one because it gets you a plus one intel, which we'll show that here in just a second. Uh, but that goes away at the end of each turn. You have to constantly re-research that one if you want to get it, but it only costs one cube. That's what these numbers at the top and bottom of the track represent. So if you invest into researching into something, you will place a cube there. So you see the Soviets, not only when it comes into satellites, They've researched the first one, but they're halfway into the next one. Space launch vehicle, they need just one more cube. If they invest again in this research, they will have enough cubes. You'll take the uh, cubes off, boom, move that up. And now they are at this research level. Obviously there are prerequisites. That's what these arrows represent. And the fact that you have to have the preceding technology. And then there's things like Boom, moon landing, moon base. Moon base is highly expensive at $3. Uh, it's $3 just, you know, 
symbolic for the game itself but that trust me is a lot of money for this game so you really uh, need to be focused if you want to be spending that kind of money on it but obviously if you land on the moon first that's a big achievement there was a space race going on on top of this so you want to try to push up that track as well so like i'm saying you can see all the different bonuses that you can get your nuclear, your space program, your industry, so how good your your country is, and to your naval, your land air, so your your naval forces, your land forces, and then how well you can feed your people. And as an example, looking here on naval gives plus one to the naval balance. And you're like, okay, Gimpy, what's that? Well, that's when we get down to this part of the board. A lot of the stuff that's going on here, not everything, but a lot of it has to do with affecting what's going on here. Like code breaking gets you that intel assessment. So you're going to move up this track. And at the end of the turn, if you're above your opponent, you can get these little chits that will allow you to get a free reroll. It is excellent to get rerolls. You definitely want to get those if you can. So having certain bonuses, think of this as like the middle and then whoever has the disc on their side is winning, right? So they get bonuses. It starts out, the US is winning the nuclear side. So they get a bonus by having the disc here. It comes in handy with certain things like Soviet aggression. If the Soviets try to be aggressive towards another country, then this gives the US an ability to make a roll to potentially stop their aggression because of the whole mad mutually assured destruction. But the conventional balance, you know, the uh, general ability to wage war, troops, tanks, that stuff, the Soviets start out with a bonus there, and that gets them a plus one with their aggressive die roll modifier, but they're plus two on this track, which means they can make major aggressions. If they're only plus one, they can only do minor aggressions. In the middle, both sides can do minor, but all the way over here, if you push it this far, then you can make the major aggressions. You can be much more aggressive. So the as just spitball in here, the Soviets could inv uh, invade. <laughs> My southern's coming through something fierce this evening. Uh, they could invade a minor nation if they were here, but by having this, they could go into a major nation. So they could go towards like uh, West Germany if they wanted to, right? It opens up possibilities to them. The US does incur some penalties when it comes to being aggressive. Uh, they get things like unrest because the democracy, the people don't really like the, the foreign wars. Uh, they take into account stuff like that. Like the Soviets were overly aggressive, the US wasn't. So you can do those things as the US, but you're gonna pay a little bit of a penalty. So this is definitely an asymmetrical type of gameplay with everything that's going on. It accounts for the, the different ideologies, equipment, research levels, all that type of stuff. All right, and very quickly on this side of the board, uh, we are looking at tech theft. This is what I was talking about earlier with the Soviets taking stuff. Basically, they're gonna get counters that can get put in here that they get to place on the board at the end round of a turn and potentially gain technologies. Computers has to do with your research. Bunkers comes in part with the strategic weapons. And the strategic weapons is kind of like a rock, paper, scissors type game to be really dumbed down about it. And the fact that certain weapons, and I'm talking about these up here, can cancel each other out. So you're not going to stack a bunch of bombers in here, okay? If, as it starts out here, the U.S. has a single bomber, if the Soviets were to buy a bomber, they would simply cancel out this bomber and this bomber would be taken away and the Soviets would put one there and our track would return to neutral. So basically they're canceling each other out. You're not gonna have big stacks of counters. You're gonna have whatever the difference is after both sides have bought their weapons. So whoever has the most is going to have that bonus. And that's what this down here is representing each unique weapon to each other weapon one. So what that means is for each unique weapon, like bomber, ICBM, submarine, MERV, you know, whatever the weapon is, you're gonna gain two points here. And that's each unique weapon that is uncontested by your opponent, okay? So 
they can't have one. They can't have whatever it is. The Soviets do not have one of these, a bomber here, so the U.S. gains two points for that. If you had other bombers, so if the Americans were to have a second bomber here, they wouldn't gain two points for that second bomber. They would only gain a single for having two of the same thing. And they would gain an extra point for each other bomber besides the first that they had there. All right, and I've, I've just got to stop talking about it because there's so much going on here. The game is so deep, there's no way I could explain everything. Uh, I'd be sitting here talking forever. So I do want to take and show you guys the game in action, let you see how the card play is going to work out. And depending on how long it takes to run through this section, how many cards we go through, will determine on whether or not I'm going to break this up into two parts or not on the video series. I kind of like to keep it all at one, but uh, it may just run too long. There's a, a lot that I want you guys to see. So depending on how long, make sure you watch it both parts if I do have to break it down into two. Uh, put any questions you have down below in the comments. And I will either see you in the next one or I will see you here in just a second. Hey guys, welcome back or either glad you're still with us, just depending on whether or not I broke this up into two parts or not. Uh, we're going to jump right back into where I was in either the previous video or this video with the play example of the game. I am using the one that is in the rule book because it ensures that I am making uh, the right choice. In other words, I'm not making any minor errors. So I'm showing you the game as clear and as clean as possible. I really wanna do it that way so I ensure I show it to you guys the right way. Uh, I've got the cards set up here, ready to go. We're not gonna play through this whole stack cause that's a lot and it'll take forever to film through all of these. Uh, but I do wanna play through at least the first couple of money cards for each one of the sides. That way you guys can kind of see the actions that they can take, things like that. And then, you know, the other card variety, what type of events they will have in the game. All right, so we draw our first card. And looking at our first card, it is the Atomic Energy Act. And we're going to start top, kind of look our way down. And this one's going to be removed. You see for both, it's either removed. So this card gets taken out. It doesn't get recycled into the discard for the next round. Looking here at the top, we see four plus if no Soviet spy is in the UK, but two plus if there is a spy in the uh, uh, the UK. And this is the US denies a nuclear technology in exchange to the UK, remove one US influence in the UK. So looking at our card, we're gonna say that we rolled a five on this check. And again, we would be looking for a four plus because there is no Soviet spy here in the United Kingdom. So that does succeed, which means the US will deny the nuclear technology exchange to the UK, and we're going to remove one US influence from them. That again is these little cubes here, the colored cubes, a little blue one. So we're gonna pull that off, but that has another added effect besides just removing the cube. We're gonna pan over here and we're going to move this down by two. And the reason we are doing that is because if we look over here at the UK, they have a factory value of two. So when you lose value, when you lose influence over a country, then you're going to lose or gain that much value. So if we gained it, we'd be moving up the track. We lose it, we'd go down the track. Remember, this can cost you victory points that you've already earned. So just because you get up to six and you go back to the beginning of the track and you get one of these little victory tokens in your hand, doesn't mean you get to keep it. You could potentially lose it depending on what happens in this track if you fall too far down on it. Now, had that role gone differently, we would have handled it another way. The US would have provided the technologies to the UK. We would have added this token to it and there would have been one tech theft placed in the UK and this little marker. So things can go one of numerous ways depending on what roles are made. It gives a little variety to the game. All right, so we've removed that card. It's not recycled, removed. And now we go to our next card, which is going to be Popular Unrest. And you see, this is just a straight D6 roll, also going to be removed depending on what's rolled. One to two, no effect. Three to four, both sides must place one unrest on an occupied country. 
five to six, both sides must uh, may place one unrest on any country. For us, in our example, we're going to say a three was rolled. And again, looking at it, that means that both sides must place an unrest on any occupied country. Or excuse me, not any, an occupied country. Now, for our example, we're going to say that the U.S. places one here in West Germany and the Soviets place one here in East Germany. All right. So this actually counts as two unrest in each one of these zones because the Occupy marker already counts as unrest. You can see it uh, is very similar to the general unrest marker, but we have a uh, coup level of four here, right? So West Germany is real stable. That's what that number four represents right there, that they will have a coup at four. Most blue countries, or blue, red countries, it's gonna be a three for an unrest. This one is at a nice stable level, so it's four. It takes a little bit more unrest for this one to have a coup happen. Now again, this card is a remove, so this one gets taken out of the deck. All right, so for our next card, when we draw, we see that we got the Berlin Blockade. Now, when we're looking at this card, it is a May roll, all right? So they don't have to take the actions listed on this card, but if they do decide to roll, then it could have good or bad things happening to them. Now, for our example, we're gonna say that they ended up rolling a four, which is actually not a good result for the Soviets. They shouldn't have decided to go down this route, but unfortunately they have to live with it. They have to add one unrest into the USSR, place another unrest token there, and that means they're up to two unrest tokens in their home country. That's not good. And they are going to remove any unrest and add one US investment in West Germany. That is not good for them because they just got that unrest placed there earlier. We'll remove this single unrest and add a single investment token there. Now that investment token could be used to remove further unrest from West Germany if they had more that could be removed, more of the red tokens. This Occupy uh, marker though cannot be removed in that manner. Now again, this card is a remove, so it's gonna be taken out of the deck. All right, so our next card gets drawn, also a remove card, and this is the Soviet Famine. This is not a good card for the Soviets. They have to roll a die, and it will determine what effects happen. Unfortunately for them, they roll bad like they did on the last turn. A three is rolled, and they suffer the effects that they have to choose to place two unrest in either the USSR or the Ukraine. So food confiscation, bad things are happening. Now, when we look here at the Ukraine, they are already in a civil war. And our example of play has plans on how to win that civil war later on. So they don't want to suffer extra effects of more unrest in this country. So instead, they're gonna take it in their home country and try to get rid of those markers with their money card later on. All right, so continuing on, we draw our next card. Our next card is a money card. You notice this one says cycle. That's because it does get placed in the discard and it will be available again on the following turn. Remember, any of these cycle cards keep getting played through again and again. Any of the remove cards, they're taken out. Now, when you get your money card, that's when you're playing your actions. That's when you get to pick like your specific stuff that you wanna do. So here, if we look at our little player aid, there is a list of all the different actions that you can place. The action that we're gonna choose is going to be place two investments. And that helps you get more uh, victory points through factories coming back online, get uh, nations more towards your side, all that good stuff. All right, so we get to place two investments and we're gonna choose to place one of those investments in the UK and we're gonna place the other one here in West Germany. Now this is an investment to try to get uh, influence back into UK later on, so we're done there. But there is something else you can do, kind of like a mini action when you place an investment and that's doing a trade role. So it's a role that you perform where you get certain modifiers for things like investments 
And we're going to do that now here in West Germany. So we would get a plus two for these investments that are here. Now for this roll to be a success, you need to have a six or above. We roll a five, but we do get the plus two for those investments. So we do get to remove this leftmost marker. It has no modifying numbers on it, so it didn't affect us negatively. And you see that has opened up factories. This factory is worth two, and we have a cube here. So that means we've gained control in this country. We have gained these factories for the US side. So if you remember last time we moved this down, when we lost our cube here in the UK, well now we get to bump that up by the number of these factories, which again is a two. So we get to pop that back up to a four. So in essence, we, we spent our investment in West Germany to gain those factories. So we gain these victory points. Okay, so now we're drawing cards again. We're gonna draw our next card and bam, there it is. We got a Soviet money card. Well, they don't have a whole lot of options of what they're going to do. Look here again, it's gonna be a cycle. So we know we're gonna, we're gonna place this in the discard because it's gonna stay in the deck. Now they have all this unrest here. They got four unrest, which means the country's in a crisis right now. They have to get rid of that. Again, looking at our potential actions here, we see one of them, because the way to get, get rid of unrest, generally it's making investments, things like that, is an easy way to get rid of them. But we can also do something else to try to gain, uh, get rid of those unrest in a different way. And that's by doing number five here, placing one spy and either making an influence roll or place one investment, All right? So we get some options, we get some stuff that stays on the board. So what the Soviets have decided to do is they're gonna place an investment and a spy into the USSR. Now an investment can be used to remove an unrest at a one-to-one. -one. So we just flat out get to bam, take that unrest right off the board for the placement of that investment. Now the thing is that spies have a little mini type action as well. And that is to remove unrest. That's one of the things spies can do. They can do many other things, but we decide that we're gonna spend one of these spies that we just placed, bam. That shows that the spy is spent and that gives us a 2d6 roll and we need a five or above to take and remove unrest. So the Soviets roll 2d6 and they get a five and a one. So that means they get to remove one more of these unrests that were placed that takes them out of crisis. They are under three, so now they're good to go. All right, so just to flesh out a little bit more with the money cards, we're gonna show one more here. And this is similar to the money card we just saw for the Soviets, except this one has the condition that if they're embargoed, this card does nothing on the roll of a one. They are not embargoed, so they just get to spend it like a money card as normal. You see the cycle again here at the bottom. Now, something neat about investments is that if you uh, don't place them in higher level countries, countries that are only worth zero or one, you can place three instead of two. So that's what the Soviets are going to decide to do here. They're gonna to choose to place investments into Estonia, the Ukraine, and also East Germany here. But they're going to use this investment to remove that unrest from earlier at a one-to-one -one ratio, and they're gonna leave those there as support for later on. Okay, so that's just a quick down and dirty example of the, the card play, the gameplay. There's a lot more going on, but I think you guys can see in that little bit of an example, the, the back and forth swing. That's the, the core of the game, gaining your control, trying to hinder your opponent's control, and you're gonna just keep slipping that back and forth as you try to gain technologies, gain influence, gain investments, win little proxy wars, all over the map. It is much larger than just here in Europe that we saw in our example. You guys can see it does obviously cover the entire globe, but there's gonna be a lot going on here in Europe. Now, one other thing I did wanna show you guys was the solo cards for the game. Because with a game of this nature, it's, it's just hard to solo. There's so much going on, but these kind of give you a, a direction. 
All right, so when you're looking at these, these are the solo cards for the game and they can be used for either side. So something like this investment, which you guys just saw, place one investment counter in a couple of different countries and it kind of gives you priorities on what you're going to do. So you see, that's the, the gist of the solo deck for the game is it'll tell you to do X and then kind of give you priorities of where to do X, whatever it is. So investments, influence, where you're gonna to try to prioritize your influence, influence again, or getting the cubes. Key thing, because you need to put the cubes down to get the, uh, the victory points, doing trade actions, going for things like technology, recruiting your spies, uh, building weapons, because that's another key thing out there, building up your arsenal to uh, have those bonus modifiers. That's a, a big thing that comes into play in this game with the technology track that you guys saw in the first part or first video is uh, going up the technology track and then the swing back and forth on the, the war tracks, the nuclear track, naval track, aggression track. Uh, most of that has to do with building those things up so they give you extra modifiers when it comes to making your different actions that you choose to do out here on the board. So do I think that this game can be solitaire? I think this game falls in the category of uh, soloing a game uh, like coin, okay? One of the coin type games. Yes, there's a solo bot uh, player aid that they go with rather than a deck of cards. And I think it's gonna operate kind of similar to this. But if you've played a coin game, one of the coin games by GMT, and you've soloed those and had fun with it, I think you can do that here. This is maybe just a touch more in depth, but at a, a relatively similar level to what you're gonna find in one of those games. So who is this game gonna be for? This game's gonna be for anyone who liked uh, Twilight Struggle, which is a buttload of people, right? Because that game's been played numerous times. There's a bunch of people who love that game and I think if you've played that game and you've had fun with it but you want something meatier to dig your teeth into uh two minutes to midnight might definitely be uh, a game you want to look at uh I think it's going to definitely scratch that cold war itch that twilight struggle did in the area control aspect of it uh like I said that pendulum right swinging back and forth you're trying to outthink your opponent and that's that I'm going to give it to it where I think the real fun of those games come from is the what if does he know what I know what I'm thinking that he's thinking and that type of gameplay. That's why I think a lot of the fun of these come from. But I still think it can be an enjoyable solitaire experience. And I am happy that they do include something like this as an option for those of us who do play our games solitaire, you know, like myself. And I have fun um, soloing coin games. So I do view this one as one that I could solo. And a lot of times I end up making what I think is the best decision anyway, which I think which I think you guys could do the same. You know, if you draw the card and it's not what you think the AI should be doing at that current moment in time, then yeah, you know, make a different choice. It's fine. It's your game. Have fun with it. So yeah, this one definitely uh, tickling a spot for me. I gotta say, like I said, the, the people who like Twilight Struggle are gonna be jumping all over this. If you put Twilight Struggle on a complexity of like two to three, four, somewhere around there, this one is gonna be more six, seven, right? So it's bouncing it up just a, a fair amount. I mean, it's not anywhere near the hardest game you're ever gonna play. It's not that complex, but it's definitely, yeah, a six to seven in complexity versus Twilight Struggles three to four. So a little bit more meat to it, fair bit more you gotta keep track of, especially with that technology track over here that I was showing you guys in the first part of the video. A lot going on over here, so you can't just focus on the area control. You gotta figure out what technologies you're going for because you have to make those sacrifices. Do I need to put my money cards towards removing the unrest that is out here on the board or do I need to put it towards gaining technologies? What is the best option I can make? Really like that uh, that complexity to that, trying to figure out what the best move is and then what move do you think your opponent's gonna make and how best you can go to counteract it. So yeah, two minutes midnight, cool. I've, I've definitely enjoyed it. Like I said in the, uh, the first part, 
uh, the components I am looking for those to be excellent considering how good the prototype components are. I don't think that's gonna be an issue. Nice cards, nice wooden pieces, counters. I mean, yeah, they're a little dingy because they're laser cut, but you guys are gonna to have to deal with that in the pro, uh, production version. So yeah, definitely one you guys wanna take a peek at and it should be on Kickstarter here soon. Uh, I will update it and let you guys know more specifically. I'll probably do a little quick rundown on the Kickstarter page itself uh, when it does release. You guys feel free to put any questions you have down below. Y'all take care. I'll see you in the next one.